for coming and subbing for me. Uh, any uh, comments, questions, concerns, problems, thoughts? Everybody shaking their head no. Does that mean that that's good or bad? I don't know. How was the exam? Yeah. As expected. As expected. All right. How many thought it was a hard exam? I'm not going to ask those who didn't think it was a hard exam because your friends will kill you. So I try to get a, a gauge of it from those who say that. So uh, how many thought it was harder than the first exam? That's almost OK. All right. So a lot more material than the first exam. Thoughts or comments at all? You ready to get in the last nine lectures of the year? Do you realize we have nine lectures counting today? You're supposed to be sad at this. <laughs> Flunk him for the day. I get kind of teary-eyed just thinking about it. I mean, you know. Uh, all right, so we have a fair amount to cover in that time. And a couple students have asked me, do we get note cards this term like we got note cards last term? And the answer is no. Oh, the answer is yes. All right, all right. <laughs> this, this is mob rule, you know? So if you guys all decided you were all going to get A's, I don't know what I would do. I'd be in probably big, even bigger trouble. All right. OK, a lot of noise here. Keep it down so people get around you can hear. All right. So. Um, Last time when I finished, I was uh, still talking about DNA repair. I'm only going to say a couple of things about DNA repair. I will only say a couple of things about DNA, re DNA recombination. And then we're going to turn our attention to transcription. And uh, transcription is obviously the next piece of the central dogma that we'll talk about. So um, DNA repair is, um, as I'm ho I hope I convinced you, uh, important. Um, you might think it's not Im that important because DNA polymerase really is very good at doing what it does. But there's two considerations here. One consideration, of course, is that if you can make a good editor a better editor, then the quality of your publication, in this case the DNA that's being produced, is improved. So the repair systems are very uh, good and important for that purpose. And the second is that not everything that affects DNA affects replication. All right? So if I have chemical damage or I have physical damage that occurs to DNA, like thymine dimers that result from UV light exposure, then having mechanisms in place to repair those is very, very important. And I say that because um, that may not have been that apparent from the things that I first told you about, but I, there are human diseases that are clearly linked to problems relating to DNA repair. And so I want to say a couple of words about those diseases, since many of you are pre-medical students uh, or pre-veterinary students, as the case may be. And understanding the link between DNA repair and disease is a very important one. The first of these I want to mention, I don't have a slide for you, is called Huntington's disease. Um, Huntington's disease is a, uh, an extremely debilitating disease. Uh, it affects uh, not a giant number of people, but a large number of people. It's an inherited disease. Um, and it is passed um, from generation to generation by virtue of the fact that the uh, manifestations of the disease don't typically appear until a person is in about their uh, 30s, 40s, after the reproductive years have um, uh, largely uh, been um, exhausted. So this gets passed uh, because people uh, do have uh, these characteristics that they pass on. Probably the most famous person uh, to have suffered from Huntington's disease uh, was uh, the folk singer Woody Guthrie. And he uh, died of the disease in his 50s, I want to say, um, and has a, had a famous son named Arlo Guthrie. Uh, it is a recessive uh, trait. Um, and I'm sorry, it is, a, it is a dominant trait. It's not a recessive trait. It's a dominant trait. And so he had, his son had a 50-50 chance of um, receiving the bad gene from his father, uh, and it wasn't until, because at the time uh, that Arlo was reaching uh, the age of maturity, uh, there weren't genetic tests like we have today where we could examine the DNA and determine if he had the bad gene or the good gene. Uh, so he didn't know what his uh, life expectancy was going to be, and it turned out he was lucky. He got the good gene. Uh, so that was um, useful. Well, how does that relate to uh, DNA repair? 
The uh, deficiency in Huntington's, Huntington's disease arises from an inability of um, the replication system to deal with what are called repeated sequences. Okay? So the repeated sequences, uh, a repeated sequence could be something like GCA, 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 kind of like we think of with a telomere, but there are places where repeated sequences appear inside the coding regions for proteins. Okay? Now, what I'm going to describe to you happens, in, it can happen in telomeres, uh, it can happen, uh, and if it happens in telomeres, the consequences are fairly small. If it happens in the coding region for a protein, the consequences can be very large, and that's one of the reasons that Huntington's disease um, is uh, a deadly disease. So um, what happens uh, in Huntington's disease is um, there are what are called, these are called triplet repeats. There are three base sequences, like I say, GCA, GCA, GCA. Um, deficiency of proteins that uh, are involved in the repair process that uh, stop the, uh, what's called the proliferation of these repeats gives rise to the, the severe problems associated with the disease. What happens if we think about a, a repeated sequence? I've got GCA, GCA, GCA. On the bottom strand, I've got, what, CGT, 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 right? right? So we can imagine that a GCA that's up here on this part will be paired with an appropriate sequence on the bottom strand. But that same sequence is present three base pairs away, right? So what can happen during the replication process is, remember the strands are pulled apart, the strands, when they come back together, what if they, they come back in the wrong way? So that this one on the top is paired with this sequence three bases away, or this one six bases away. Well, what you create when you do that is you create a looped out sequence, and now you have two strands that do not have the same number of repeats in them. What can happen to that over time is you can change the number of repeats that exist in that given sequence. Well, since these occur in protein coding regions, if this is a protein that's involved in um, the uh, uh, nervous system, which uh, some of the Huntington's disease problems uh, have proteins uh, in, in this uh, regard, then what happens is now you've changed the amino acid sequence of a critical protein. Instead of having maybe three copies of an alanine, 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 you might have 50. Okay? Well, you could imagine, based on what we've talked about in class about how amino acid sequence is critical for protein structure. If I change a protein from having three alanines in a row to having 50 because this thing just keeps changing and changing, there are going to be some severe consequences that arise. And that's what happens in Huntington's disease. It is a deficiency in uh, some of the genes involved in DNA repair and uh, gives rise to some very severe problems. There are cancers uh, also that arise from deficiencies uh, in DNA repair. Uh, HNPCC uh, is one also called Lynch syndrome. It's a, an inherited uh, form of, of um, uh, a disease that, that is linked to colon cancer. And uh, this uh, uh, disease is deficient in several different ways in which uh, uh, proteins involved in DNA repair. Um, are not properly functioning, okay? And uh, Dr. Andrew Burmeyer on our campus is an expert in this. His lab researches this and tries to characterize at the protein level and also at the DNA level what happens in this uh, mutational mechanism that arises. If damage to DNA that occurs um, in, uh, particularly in this case in the colon, is not repaired, we could imagine that there will be mutation of genes, more mutation, of course, is more likely to affect an oncogene and more likely to give rise uh, to a tumor. Uh, another uh, important gene uh, to think about with respect to DNA repair does not actively play a role in repairing DNA, but it plays a role in the process of repairing DNA. What does that mean? Well, P53, I'm sure many of you have heard of by now, uh, but if you haven't, I'll tell you a little bit about it. P53 is a gene that is involved in what's called quality control with respect to DNA replication. It is a gene that is found in uh, virtually all eukaryotic cells, or equivalents of it thereof are spread throughout uh, eukaryotes. And what it does is it monitors the replication process. It monitors the replication process so that um, 
The revocation process, you may recall, I said in eukaryotic cells is fairly carefully orchestrated. It occurs during a specific part in the cell cycle. And um, there has to be some assurance that everything is complete, that is, replication has completed and it has completed properly before the next phase of the cell cycle occurs. We can't have cells starting to divide if the DNA is not completely replicated. So P53 plays a very important role in basically telling the cell, yes, replication is complete and everything's okay. Well, replication doesn't always go okay. And if there are problems that occur during the replication of the chromosomes, P53 actually steps in. So if there's, let's say, chemical damage that has happened to a segment of a chromosome and the DNA polymerase is going along and it can't deal with that damage that happens to be at the replication fork, that uh, chromosome will not be able to complete replication. When that happens, P53 literally steps in and uh, stimulates uh, activation, transcription, translation of uh, uh, enzymes involved in DNA repair. So P53 acts as a transcription factor, that is, it can activate the transcription of other genes, and it's invoked when the signal arrives that replication has not proceeded um, properly, it has not completed properly. At that point, P53, because it steps in and stimulates this repair process and stimulates the activation of these genes, stops the cell cycle in its tracks. So that's the physical stop that happens. The cell cycle does not proceed, and the cell is basically given time to try to repair that damage. So the genes uh, involved in the repair process get synthesized. They travel to the place where the uh, damage or where the replication has stalled, and they act to try to repair that damage. There's two possibilities, of course. One is that they repair the damage, and if they repair the damage, then P53 says, okay, I'm going to let go of the cell cycle and let the cell cycle proceed so that the cell can go ahead with the division that it was already setting out to do with the synthesis of the DNA. The other possibility, of course, is that P53, uh, I'm sorry, that the, the repair process may not complete. The repair uh, enzymes throw up their hands and say, there's no way that we can fix this. When that happens, P53 initiates uh, a process called cellular suicide, also known as apoptosis, and that's spelled A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S, -P -P the most mispronounced name in molecular biology. The second P is silent, okay, apoptosis. And when that happens, the cell commits suicide. There's a, a, a series of events that happen that result in basically the cell dying and uh, not, prolifer not, not going on and passing on what would be bad genes to daughter cells that would, uh, of, cor uh, of course, have a high potential for um, having mutations in important genes. So P53 is a very, very critical player in this process. Not surprisingly, some cancers arise because of mutations in P53. Okay? So imagine that General Motors has a quality control division that inspects every car before it comes off of the assembly line and occasionally finds a car that has a dent in it or a car that has a non-functioning engine or something. That quality control group would obviously uh, take that car away and not allow it to be sold. Um, P53 is doing a similar thing. Take away that quality control group, you're going to have more cars that are going to slip out the door, they're going to have problems, and you're going to have some very unhappy uh, consumers at some point. So, not surprisingly, if we take away that quality control of P53, we're going to have some cells that are going to have some problems. Okay, so um, that's in a nutshell uh, some of the important things to consider with respect to the proper uh, repair of damage to DNA. Uh, these uh, two things I want uh, on the screen, um, I'm only going to talk about the one on the bottom, are important um, uh, uh, effectors of DNA. They, they can bind to, they can covalently bind to DNA and basically stop DNA replication uh, or cause damage that would otherwise uh, be problematic. One of these, the one you see on the bottom called cisplatin, is actually used in a variety of chemotherapy uh, approaches. Um, cisplatin um, can, as I say, bind to DNA, prevent its replication, and uh, if the target is a tumor cell, uh, we could imagine that this would be a very useful uh, tool. 
All right, the last thing I'll mention about DNA repair is that there is a uh, standard laboratory test that is uh, given to um, try to um, uh, determine what we describe as the mutagenicity of a given compound. The mutagenicity. What does mutagenicity mean? Well, mutagenicity means the likelihood to favor mutation. The likelihood to favor mutation. Okay? Well, you hear about compounds and you say, oh, that's a carcinogen. Okay? That's a carcinogen. Well, it's linked to cancer. It would be useful to know if I have a mutagen, because a mutagen is probably itself going to be carcinogenic because it's going to favor mutation. You've already seen that the more mutation you have, the more likely you have damaged cells that lead to problems down the line. Well, there's a test called the Ames test that is used to measure the mutagenicity of compounds. And so I want to just spend uh, a minute and tell you a, a, a little bit about that. The Ames test uh, can be performed fairly simply. It's not a perfect test, but it's a pretty darn good one. And what's beautiful about it is its simplicity. It relies on the fact that um, it directly allows a researcher to compare how many mutations happen in the presence of a given compound compared to the absence of that compound. That's what it allows a person to do. Now, this figure, unfortunately, is not the best uh, figure for describing what I'm going to tell you. So I, I show it because that's what your book has, but I don't have a better figure to show you. So I'm going to have to tell you a little bit about this. In the Ames test, if I take a plasmid, okay, and the plasmid has the coding for a given gene, okay, that gene might be, let's say, uh, the ability to produce a blue color. Okay? If I had that plasmid and I put it into a bacterium, the plasmid will make a blue color. Right? Well, let's say I'm interested in studying how mutagenic this compound is. Imagine I put this plasmid into a bacterium and I treat it with this uh, chemical that I'm interested in studying. And I ask the question, does it affect how much blue color I get? Well, that would be one way of doing this experiment, but it wouldn't be a very effective one because most cells aren't going to be affected by this compound. I need something that's more sensitive than that. What if I get 3,124,000 cells that have blue color and I get 3 million cells that have blue color in the treated one? Well, I say, well, I've got fewer cells that have it, so is it mutagenic? Well, that isn't a very sensitive assay because that's within my experimental error. 3 million versus 3.1 million. All right? So what I do is I flip it around. I take that same gene, and I make a single mutation in the gene that's in that plasmid. One single mutation, but it's a very critical one. Because when that mutation is present, no gene is made. No blue color. Okay? So I take this plasmid, and I, I give it to cells, and... I have a bunch of cells that have no blue color, right? They've got the plasmid, but they've got this defective gene. Everybody with me? Bunch of cells, defective gene. Now, I'm interested in studying things that favor mutation. With this system I've just described to you, I can study cells, how frequently they mutate that one critical base. And how will I know? Well, every time it mutates that one critical base, what's going to happen? Blue color. Right? So to do my experiment, I take my cells that already have the plasma with the defective gene, I divide them in half. One half gets the treatment. Let's say I'm interested in studying um, saccharin. Is saccharin mutagenic? One batch of cells gets saccharin. One batch of cells doesn't get saccharin. I played them out on plates, and I asked the question, which one gives more blue color? Will some cells have blue color even if they don't have saccharin? Yes. Why? Because like that famous bumper sticker, mutation happens. Okay? It would be a great bumper sticker, wouldn't it? Mutation happens. 
It happens at a certain frequency. When I plate cells, I can put several million cells on a plate, and if I have a mutation rate that's, let's say, one in a million, I'm going to have a few, a few of those colonies that are going to come up that are going to have blue color. But the beauty of this method is that I can say, well, how many blue colonies do I get in the presence of saccharin compared to the absence of saccharin? If the presence of saccharin has 50 colonies and the absence of saccharin has one colony, hmm, maybe saccharin is mutagenic. Maybe that's why I'm seeing that increase in number. This is a very simple test. It's not proof, but it's a very simple test that allows us to answer the question, is this compound mutagenic at least in E. coli? Okay? Is, it, is it mutagenic in human cells? That's another matter. But this is the basis of the Ames test. All right, now I'm doing all the talking. I will slow down and take any questions that you might have about that. Yes, Connie. So the, for the Ames test, does a very specific mutation have to happen for that blue color to be produced? Yes, because it was a specific mutation that stopped it from being produced in the first place. Does it undercount the number of mutations? I'm not trying to count the total number of mutations. I'm trying to compare the number of mutations. It's relative. So I have the same parameters in each set of cells, so it's a relative number that I'm getting. I'm not claiming that the Ames test, and that's a very important point. It's a very important point of confusion. People think, it tells me how many mutations. No, it doesn't. It tells you the relative number of mutations. Make sense? Uh, Jody. So this is primarily to test for single base pair mutations, right? This is testing for the likelihood to make a single base pair mutation. Yes. What about excisions or frame shifts? Again, it's a simple test. Uh, excisions and frame shifts will affect that, okay? And they may give rise to blue color. So it's not exclusively that, but the design is for single base pair mutations. Yes. As I say, it's not a comprehensive test. But if I'm really interested in the compound, it's very easy for me to test and see, well, in the Ames test, is it giving me uh, a higher number of blue colonies? Okay, that's, that's useful. Okay. Oh, yeah. Is Huntington's disease found in other animals or just humans? That's a good question. I believe it's found in other animals as well. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not an expert on Huntington, Huntington's disease. I, I don't know that. But I, um, I would be surprised if there wasn't an animal equivalent of it since it's a very general reproductive failure. Okay. So um, the last thing I want to talk about very briefly is recombination. Okay. And recombination, um, we hear about it. Uh, we don't really study it uh, an awful lot, at least on this campus. Uh, many people have their whole lives dedicated to studying recombination. Um, but it's a very important uh, process. It's important to recognize that recombination um, allows segments of DNA to get swapped. Not everything that happens in the cellular division process arises solely from replication. So there's other forces that can drive mutation besides replication processes. And one of these is recombination. So recombination allows different DNAs to swap segments. Cells have built in mechanisms to allow this. Why in the world would a cell be favoring a process that's allowing mutation and change to occur, the answer to that question is if it didn't occur, we wouldn't be here. We've selected for it. We have selected for it. We see proteins that facilitate recombination starting all the way in the very simplest of organisms and proceeding all the way through human beings. Okay? With recombination, it is safe to say that you have segments of DNA in you that neither of your parents have. Neither of your parents have. We think about, well, I get one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad, and therefore, everything I have is like mom and dad. But segments of those chromosomes can mix and match 
on the way to getting to you. And as a consequence, you have, every person has DNAs that are not identical to DNAs in either of your parents. It's for that reason that in some cases, identical twins may not be absolutely identical. Okay. Mutation can also affect that. But recombination is a darn good way that a very tiny segment of DNA can be present in one twin but not the other, depending upon when the recombination event occurred. All right. Well, the mechanisms of recombination are really more than I want to uh, go through here, but I will just briefly show you this method here called strand invasion. And strand invasion happens uh, when DNAs of same or similar sequences align with each other. This can happen during the replication process. And when this happens, if we look at, let's say, my two identical DNAs here, it's not unreasonable that if I take a piece of the top strand here, or, or, or let's say, the, I guess the bottom strand is what they've used, so the bottom strand here, and I let it invade a partner DNA, that there's going to be quite a few, maybe not perfect base pairs here, but quite a few base pairs here because, again, they're related sequences to start off with. Proteins in our cells will facilitate this. They facilitate this because, again, over evolutionary time, it's biologically favorable to allow this process to occur. Well, once this guy invades, there's got to be resolution, and there's resolution that happens as a result of something that's called a holiday junction. This shows that invasion process. And no, you're not going to have to regurgitate this because I couldn't draw that if I had to. All right? But a holiday junction is an intermediate that's formed during recombination that involves what's called a cruciform structure. It looks like a cross. There's an X that's there. Okay? Well, this, if you follow it all the way through, involves strand invasion. Strand invasion may be followed by replication. It may be followed by repair. And because of these processes, especially the repair process, the mismatch repair that's there, now we create some new sequences that were not present in either of these DNAs to start. This can allow proteins to evolve. This can allow proteins to gain new function. This can cause problems. Okay? But this is yet another mechanism whereby this change can occur. Ultimately, this guy has to, these two sequences have to resolve with each other. And the product of this gives two DNAs that have different sequences than either one of them had to start with. This process is called homologous recombination because it, re it requires the sequences to be very similar to each other in, in start. Not all recombination is homologous recombination. Not all types of recombination are homologous recombination. There are some systems that appear to insert DNAs relatively randomly. Okay. One of the cellular proteins that's involved in resolving this process is called integrase, I-N-T-E-G-R-A-S-E. -E. Okay. There are systems that have integrases. And one of the systems that has an integrase that's very similar to the ones that we have in our cell is HIV. HIV, as part of its life cycle, has to insert itself into human chromosomes in order to make a stable infection. Needless to say, one of the strategies for stopping the proliferation of HIV is to inhibit the integrase. And there are some drugs that are out there that will do that. Okay. Now, HIV's integrase is a really good example of one that does not do homologous recombination. It inserts relatively randomly. So we can't predict where HIV is going to insert in a human chromosome. Okay? It's going to go in many potential places. It may go in many places. That's one of the issues that arise in trying to deal with it. Okay. 
Um, that's what I want to say about recombination. Comments, questions? When? I'm sorry, say it again. You, you said that uh, some genes are not from uh, our parents in our bodies. Yes. Does that, that usually give a minor, um, like, um, like for feature-wise, feature or, or like uh, give you a big impact? Okay, so his question relates to the fact that I said that you have sequences in you that are not identical to those of either of your parents. These are relatively few, okay? But imagine, if you will, that, uh, and his question then is, is, does that have minor or major impact? It depends on the sequence. So there will be some sequences that may recombine, and when they recombine, make a non-functional gene. If that's a non-functional gene that's critical for survival, gone. You never see them, right? That gene might have to do with a slight lightening of the hair. That gene might have to do with something we couldn't even physically measure. So there's no set answer to that. It really depends on the nature and the diversity of genes that are out there. But this could, a recombination can happen with any gene, any gene in the genome. Okay. Well, let's turn our attention to transcription. We're moving from, RN, from DNA to RNA. And transcription... I will talk about in this class in two respects. So what I'm going to talk about today and on Wednesday, and probably it will now spill over into Friday a little bit, is transcription in a very general sense. I'll talk about translation after that, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about transcription as part of a bigger process called gene expression. All right? So you're going to get transcription largely in two doses. The first dose is going to be fairly basic, probably things that you've covered in other biology classes, the gene expression component will probably be, will be in more depth and, and may not have been things that you've heard of before. All right. Well, I always warn my students that you darn sure should know what the term transcription means. And when I say you should know what it means, it means that you should have something besides a definition of it in mind. All right. You got to pound into your head that transcription occurs when RNA polymerase copies the DNA and makes and RNA. I will warn you about this. I will ask you a question on the exam about this, and I will guarantee you that at least a quarter of you in here will get it wrong. I've warned you. Okay? DNA replication, transcription, translation. You should have no confusion whatsoever about what those involve. You should have no confusion whatsoever in terms of what's being made and how it's being made. Okay? Absolutely, you need to understand that. Okay? Transcription, as I said, synthesis of RNA from DNA. It requires an enzyme called an RNA polymerase. RNA polymerases are similar to DNA polymerases, at least in some respects. If we look at RNA polymerases, we see that sort of hand structure. Now the hand is turned sort of like this. The DNA polymerase had that hand, and we said that the DNA double helix fit inside of here. Those fingers were sort of holding it and supporting it, and we see something like that as we look to, at RNA polymerases. Moreover, if we compare prokaryotic versus eukaryotic, we see again structure is not very different from one to the other. Structure implies function. A structure is important for function, therefore structure will be conserved if it is an important function, and yeah, it's an absolutely important function. RNA polymerases differ from DNA polymerases in several respects. Okay? First, RNA polymerases do not, underline not, require a primer. DNA polymerases require a primer complete difference between the two. There are many similarities between RNA polymerases and DNA polymerases. Both work in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Here's the difference. RNA polymerase doesn't work nearly as fast as DNA polymerase does. DNA polymerase will kick along at about 1,000 nucleotides a second, at least in E. coli. 
in E. coli, RNA polymerase moves along at about 50 nucleotides a second. Okay. Why the big difference? Well, one of the reasons is that, and this is another difference, RNA polymerases don't make long stretches of nucleic acid. A few thousand base pairs is as much as an RNA polymerase will make. It's not a race. As we will see in prokaryotes, the synthesis of RNA and the synthesis of protein occur in the same time and place. And so RNA polymerase's rate of movement in prokaryotic cells appears to be about the same rate of movement of the synthesis of the protein on that RNA. So that coordination between the two may be very, very important. RNA polymerase only copies one strand. DNA polymerase, of course, copies both strands. There's leading strand and lagging strand replication in DNA synthesis, but there's not in RNA synthesis. Only one strand is copied. DNA replication, I told you, started at origins. RNA synthesis also occurs at specific places. They're called promoters. Not surprisingly, a very common feature of promoters are AT-rich sequences. Part of the transcription process requires the strands being separated in order to get the RNA polymerase in. And the easier it is to separate those strands, the easier it is to start RNA uh, synthesis. Your book goes through talking about subunits. I'm not going to talk about subunits. I'm not going to hold you responsible for subunits. They do have some interesting uh, separate functions, but I'm not going to talk about them here. I do want to think a little bit about copying of a DNA to make RNA. We remember, of course, that another difference is that in RNA we use UTP instead of DTTP. I think everybody knows that. So RNA will have U's in it where DNA had T's in it. Okay. Now, here's a DNA sequence that's here in red and blue. All right. Here is the RNA that's made from it. Which strand was copied, the red or the blue? The red was the copied strand because I have A where there was T and A there was T. Think about this. The other strand is going to have the same sequence as the RNA does, right? It's going to have the same sequence as the RNA does, so it's going to have T's in place of U's. We call the two, we, have, we give names to the two strands of DNA relative to the RNA. The strand that's being copied or has been copied is called the template strand because it provided a template for making the RNA. The strand that has essentially the same sequence as the RNA is called the coding strand. Okay. Now, another feature of this figure that I want you to recognize is right here where this bar is. With RNA, we invoke a numbering system because that numbering system helps us to orient where in the DNA the RNA is being made. You'll notice that plus one is the very first nucleotide where the RNA is made. There's plus one, there's plus two, there's plus three, plus four, plus five, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If we go away from where that start point was, we give them negative numbers. There's no zero in this scheme, by the way. Okay. Now, we'll see that the negative numbers will be important as we describe control sequences known as promoters, because the promoters are located over here in the negative numbers, for the most part. Okay. Um, I don't want to talk about that. And I don't want to talk about that. And I don't want to talk about that. What this figure is, uh, is alluding to is something I'll just briefly mention to you, and that is that RNA polymerase doesn't move as fast as DNA polymerase does, and it does, it moves in what we call fits and starts. 
it'll go for a stretch, and then it'll slow down. It might even back up, and then it'll go forwards, and then it'll sort of back up. And this might seem a little confusing, but it appears uh, that there's two factors at play here. One factor is that the RNA synthesis system is not set up like the DNA synthesis system is. The DNA synthesis system, we had a helicase that was unwinding and pulling everything apart as rapidly as it could. We had a topoisomerase system that was setting up and was not allowing those strands to get untangled. RNA polymerase doesn't have as sophisticated of a system in which it works. That means then that RNA polymerase is going to be more affected by the sequences it is moving through during the transcription process. Because remember, it's moving between those two strands and moving down. It's moving in what we call a bubble. Those strands are being peeled apart. It's copying one strand. The other strand is just going the other direction. That means that sequence will affect the rate with which it moves. You might expect that GC-rich sequences, harder to pull apart, might slow down the process. They do. Okay. The other thing that's important with respect to the movement is this moving forwards and then shuffling backwards appears to be helping the RNA polymerase to do at least a little bit of proofreading. A little bit. The synthesis of RNA is much more error prone than the synthesis of DNA. It's going slower and it's more error prone. What gives with that? Well, again, Speed is not the most important thing. And fidelity is not the most important thing either. Fidelity meaning the accuracy with which it is copying things. Well, why not? Remember, RNA is not passed from generation to generation to generation. In fact, what you will see with RNA is once it's made in the cell, it has a lifetime. It gets made, it gets used, it gets broken down. And there's a cycle of that. It gets made, it gets used, it gets broken down. If the cell makes a mistake making a given RNA, not a biggie. It's going to make 50 others that aren't going to have that mistake. It doesn't have that option with DNA. Okay? It doesn't have that option with DNA. So, it's very important then that cells... Um, um, let me back up and say, say, say it in the proper way. That the synthesis of RNA is not as critical as the synthesis of DNA is for the, for the lifetime or the longevity of the organism. Errors can happen and things will still proceed. Now, some proofreading is done, but not nearly as much is done as there is in DNA. Okay, let's talk in the time I have left about promoters. Promoters are easiest to understand starting with prokaryotes and that's most of what I'm going to be talking about here. What is a promoter? Okay. In prokaryotic cells a promoter is different in terms of uh, functionality than it is in eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells we could describe a promoter as a sequence that RNA polymerase binds to and starts transcription nearby. It's a sequence that RNA polymerase binds to and starts transcription nearby. In eukaryotic cells that we'll talk about later, it's much more complicated. We're going to start with the simplest first. All right. Now, what you see on the screen is a depiction of negative numbered sequences relative to a bunch of different genes in E. coli. Here's five different genes in E. coli. And when people lined these up for hundreds of genes, they started seeing some characteristic patterns. At about minus 10, and this is approximate, but at about minus 10, most prokaryotic cells have what's called a Tata box. They have a TA, TA rich region at about minus 10. Now, from what I've told you about hydrogen bonds and so forth, this should make very good sense because 
the RNA polymerase is going to start over here, having some ATs to pull apart easily. Close to that is really useful. The Tata box makes very good sense. This Tata box is also called the Pripno box, P-R-I-B-N-O-W, named by the person who first recognized this. Okay. Not all genes have the same sequence. There is a, in fact, as you look across this, there's not a single one that has a T-A-T-A-A-T. -A -A well, why do we call it, why do we have this sequence down here? This is the average sequence if we compare hundreds of genes. And we say, what's the most likely T here? What's the most likely sequence here? It's A. What's the most likely sequence here? It's T. Not all of these genes have that. Does that mean that these don't work as promoters? No. But it means something very important. The closer a given sequence for a, a promoter of a gene is to a perfect Tata box, the more RNAs will be made from it. The RNAs being starting over here. So if I have something that's a T-A-T-A-A-T, the gene that's associated with that the cell is going to make a lot of that RNA. The more RNA it makes, the more protein it makes. Now, we haven't talked about it before, but we have to start thinking about quantitative things. DNA replication occurs and we get two copies. Bang. We do two and we get four. But in a given cell, cells have different needs for different proteins. You saw when I talked about DNA polymerase 3 that there were only five or six copies in the entire E. coli cell. But for DNA polymerase 1, I said there were thousands. Part of that control is exerted by how many RNAs are made. Things that I need more of, I make more RNAs of. So we see that changes in sequences relative to the promoter will allow a cell to sort of decide how much of this that I need. That's really useful. Okay? I don't want to waste making thousands and thousands of copies of DNA polymerase 3 if I only need six proteins per cell. It's a waste of energy. That cell is not going to be competing very well because it's going to be wasting its energy on making things that it's not going to use. On the other hand, if I need a lot of hexokinase because I've got all kinds of sugar there and I'm only making one or two copies of that RNA per cell, what's going to happen? Well, the cell's not going to have enough hexokinase, and without hexokinase, no very little glycolysis, and glycolysis is where the cell gets its energy. That cell is also going to be dead in the water. So the level of synthesis of RNA is a very, very important factor. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about it in the next few days. That note, I will let you go. So when RNA